we are ready. Here we have to Dr. Lorraine Eden. Lorraine, are you there? Welcome to Mexico again, Lorraine. Let me uh, introduce properly to Dr. Lorraine Eden. Uh, Dr. Lorraine Eden is professor and made a map of management in the Mays Business School and research professor of law in the School of Law at Texas A&M University. Dr. Eden is considered one of the founders of the field of transfer price and economics. She has more than 185 publications, including taxi multinationals, multinationals in North America, retrospectives on public finance, multinationals and transfer pricing, the ethical professors, the economics of transfer pricing, and research methods in international business. She's now working on her 10th book titled Principles of Transfer Pricing. Dr. Eden, in my opinion, she's the best transfer pricing economist in the field. Welcome to Mexico again, Lorraine. Buenos dias. Um, I'm delighted to be here. And I'm honored to be invited to speak at the third Pan American University Conference. And I want to thank you for the invitation. My name is Lorraine Eden. I'm a professor at Texas A&M University. My talk today is going to be a little less technical and a more big picture than I think uh, the talks we've heard so far and probably the ones coming after me. I think that's a bit of the advantage of being an academic. You can stand a little bit outside the policy debates and look at the larger questions and play a bit of devil's advocate. And so I'm going to do that today. My talk is entitled David and the Three Goliaths Defending the Arms Link Principle. Um, I don't think I have to tell anybody listening to this call that the arm's length, uh, what the arm's length principle is or arm's length standard. I think we have a very good common body of understanding that has emerged over time about what it is and what's needed to satisfy it. Simple form is to call it what would independent enterprises do under the same set of facts and circumstances. To answer the question, we do detailed comparability analyses that look at the facts and circumstances, product characteristics, contract terms, functions, assets, and risks, market conditions, any other kinds of factors that could influence this. People that are in this field are highly skilled professionals here, and um, I think well, we well understand what's going on often the general public does not. And um, what has happened is that transfer pricing has moved from what 10 years, even 10 years ago would have been an unknown term to now what's seen as a, uh, uh, in effect, a dirty word here. What I want to do here is talk to you about three criticisms of the arm's length standard, what I'm calling the three Goliaths. And I think have some of them are historical, some of them have emerged over the last few years. The first of these Goliaths of criticisms is abuse of transfer pricing. The idea that multinationals have been deliberately engaging in aggressive transfer pricing that is extensive, unfair, and draining development. This is not a new criticism. It goes all the way back to uh, exports of raw materials from Latin America in the 1960s and the 1970s. The second Goliath, and we heard a bit of that in the first talk today, is that the arm's length standard doesn't work because of the absence of arm's length com comparables and the presence of synergies. In other words, the absence of comparables and the presence of synergies are reasons why the arm's length standard doesn't work and needs to be replaced. And then the third of these Goliaths is the new one, that the arm's length standard can't work in the digital economy. In a world of scale without mass, where multinational profits come from intangible assets, from data, from network effects, has the arm's length principle finally met its match and it has to be replaced. I'm gonna argue like David in the parable of David and Goliath, 
that the arms like standard is sufficiently robust and sufficiently flexible that it can handle all three of these criticisms and does not need to be replaced. So let me start then with the first one, Goliath number one, abusive transfer pricing. Uh, this I think is a real example of shooting the messenger. There clearly there has been abusive transfer pricing. There's no question about that in my mind or in the mind of most of us. It's the reason why the BEPS project was launched. But I think much of that problem is shooting the messenger. Transfer pricing is a small part of the problem. The big problem is at the level of the international tax regime. In other words, it's an income tax design problem. What's been going on is an argument of shooting the messenger rather than trying to fix this. In other words, the international tax system has had gaping holes in it that offered many legal opportunities for multinationals to engage in regulatory arbitrage. The rules have got ever and more complicated. There are more and more governments taxing it. And there are very well-skilled professionals who know how to exploit and have come up with all kinds of new ideas and ways to, to work around the system and engage in regulatory arbitrage. Let me just take a quick second and stop back and talk about what I think of as these two layers, the international tax system and then the transfer pricing. The international tax system is based on the idea of residence and source. Businesses engage in cross-border activities to earn income, uh, and then that income, because it's occurring in two places, one of the two countries, residence or source, has to be given primary right to tax. For business profits, the primary right to tax goes to the source country. The residence country can tax also, but must make tax room, typically through a foreign tax credit. For royalties and for technical services and a lot of other payments like that, the first crack went the other way. It went to the residence countries. And in many cases, the source countries didn't even tax, so that the residence countries alone were given primary right to tax. However, Article 12 was added a couple of years ago in the UN Model Convention, for example, that would include royalties such that, uh, such that source based countries could also potentially levy a tax on royalties. 12A was added for technical services, and we're going to hear maybe a little bit later on from our UN representatives talking about 12B, a possible tax on digital services. In all of this world with residents and source, the key thing is that figuring out whether the entity has sufficient nexus to a jurisdiction that it can qualify for tax. Foreign subsidiaries are obviously due. Foreign branches may do if they meet permanent, um, permanent establishment test rules. Once you do this, you tax on a country by country basis. You tax in the residence country, you tax in the source country. And obviously one thing that can happen is where do the uh, payments and the revenues come from? Well, to the extent that we're within the multinational group, the multinational can engage in transfer pricing and shift that money between those two buckets, between the residents and source jurisdictions. That's why transfer pricing rules were put in. They were put in as a stop gap to the international tax rules, all right, to make those rules work by ensuring that the money was declared in the right jurisdiction and was done at arm's length based on what independent enterprises would have, would have done. Well, clearly we haven't had that, and that's one of the reasons why transfer pricing has become a dirty word. And so the BEPS project was designed to deal with these base erosion and profit shifting uh, opportunities. I think the first best solution would have been a return to a world of classical taxation based on worldwide income, but I think that's gone nowhere in the last few years. What's happened is let's close the loopholes, and that's what the BEPS project did. And I'm here today to say I have just finished reading a couple of days ago the progress report that the OECD has issued. OECD G20 Inclusive Framework on BEPS Progress Report, July 2019 to July 2020. And I'm here to say congratulations to the OECD, right? This is a wonderful good news report of all the things that have been done 
to deal with the abusive holes that exist in the international tax system. The report walks you through each of the action items from the 2000, uh, 2015, goes through and says what's been done and what's been accomplished to date. Simple little one, tax inspectors without borders, right, which is something I very much believe in, has already raised $530 million for developing countries. Uh, action item three on the CFC rules, 122 countries have been surveyed, 49 now have CFC rules, 11 have no substantial tax uh, tests. Action item five, harmful tax practices, 287 regimes have been looked at, same standard across the board for all of them. Now we have exchange of information on 18,000 rulings. Action item six, tax treaty abuse. Right, one of the core concerns that motivated the BEPS project. The MLI, which we've just been listening to, has been signed by 94 countries, ratified by 49, covers 300 double tax treaties, and will eventually, once everybody's ratified it, will cover nearly 2,000 double tax treaties. Number seven, a permanent establishment. That's been broadened from simply looking at a physical place of business to including much broader things. And of course, there's been much more discussion about that in terms of significant economic presence. And I'll talk about that later. Eight, nine, and 10 are the transfer pricing ones. And even big changes came here, which I will talk about later, that were designed to align transfer pricing outcomes with value creation. And a big one, 13, C by CR. Now there are 2,500 bilateral C by CRs and the new 2016 data sets just been released for 26 countries and 4,000 multinationals. We are gonna have tax certainty day. Um, in other words, let me stop here. Read the report yourself. It, it should be a source of, how shall I say it? A, a real proof that the BEPS-1 project has worked, that governments have recognized that the system had created all kinds of tax loopholes and that by working and banding together, governments could plug those loopholes and end much of the problem. To the extent that that's happened and is happening, the incentives for abusive tax transfer pricing go away or at least very significantly reduced. So my response to the sort of first one is to say BEPS has been really successful so far in dealing with the underlying problem here. And don't shoot the messenger. Transfer pricing can be fine and works fine in a world when all the tax loopholes and regulatory arbitrage opportunities are shrunken and gone away. Another proposal for this is global formulary apportionment, and I'm well on record many times as saying how opposed I am to GFA. Um, Hazu asked me to mention a couple of the reasons why, so let me mention a couple. Number one, a mixed system of both the arm's length principle and formulary apportionment would impose huge compliance costs on multinationals. Lots of double tax opportunities. Number two, Formulary apportionment is simply too blunt an instrument to represent the true taxable income that multinationals have in each country. Number three, the three-factor formula that typically is used, sales, labor, and tangible assets, doesn't even get at the intangible assets that are the sine qua non of the long-run advantage of multinationals. Another one is the formulary approach simply, I think, really misses the whole point of trying to get at the beneficial economic ownership of intangibles and synergies within the MNE group. Uh, another one that is, I think, very important is there are very few examples worldwide of using formulary apportionment. They're typically done at the second tier level, state uh, in the United States or provinces in Canada. And I think a very telling piece of information that everybody ignores is how small the amount of money is being raised through formulary apportionment. 4% of state tax revenues in the United States are raised with formulary apportionment. That's peanuts. 
In other words, the only real experience we have with formulary apportionment is state multi-compact, and it's only 4% of the state tax revenues, which aren't very big. So our experience is very, very limited here. And then the last thing I want to say is you can play games with formulary apportionment just as you could play games in the old tax hole system that we had uh, pre-BEPS. You can shift income on any one of those components. You can shift it with allocation keys. So thinking that a move to formulary apportionment is going to reduce tax arbitrage opportunity, in my view, is simply wishful thinking. Let me move to my, in my so, so let me just sum and say, Goliath number one, transfer pricing is abusive. I think I've tried to convince you that if it was abusive, and I believe it really was, that was in the days before the implementation of the action items in BEPS 1. And the good news report that's just been issued by the OECD, if you read it, should tell you very clearly that much of those opportunities for tax arbitrage are gone. The solution is then give BEPS a chance. Let BEPS work. Let the first round of all those action items work and I think that abusive transfer pricing goes away on its own. All right, number two, Goliath number two. The arm's length standard is unworkable in theory and it's unworkable in practice. And we heard a little bit about this today. Too few comparables, too many synergies, if you want to boil it down. Too few comparables, too many synergies. Well, my view is if you look at this both from a theoretical point of view and from a practical point of view, it's quite possible to handle both of these. These in some sense, clearly they're problems. I don't disagree they're problems, but I think both in theory, economists can explain what to do about synergies and what you do when you don't have external markets because of interdependencies or because external markets are, are um, problematic for some reason or another. So we know as economists how to think about this. And I've talked elsewhere about Hirschleifer's rule. And Hirschleifer's rule says in the absence, when we don't have arms like comparables, what do we do? We look to what the multinational would have set inside in the absence of these government regulations and how it would have priced those transactions. And it would have priced it based on the marginal cost of the exporting firm, or let me say it in a simple way, it would have placed it based on opportunity cost, the next best use of the resources. It is possible to figure that out, and as I will make an, an argument in a couple of minutes, the 2017 OECD transfer pricing guidelines go a long way to actually writing that out in practice. There have certainly been a variety of attempts to try and get at this, all the way from the 1998 white paper, all the way down to looking at uh, setting up uh, uh, cost sharing and cost contribution arrangements for DEMPI activities, where you're actually co-developing the activities. We now have cost contribution and shared services arrangements that look at aligning the reasonably anticipated benefits with the share of costs and doing buy-ins and buy-outs using the income method that in practice are designed to take advantage of these interdependencies and synergies within the multinational group. The transfer pricing guidelines in 2017 where outcomes must be in line with value creation do this they look not only at the legal and contractual rights and obligations of the parties, but they look at the economic substance in terms of functions, assets, and risks, and the relative bargaining power of the parties. And here you take account of reasonably available options and alternatives, such as make it yourself, status quo, and the ability to walk away. What comes out from a close read of looking at the intangibles chapter here and the new finance chapter also is there's no right answer that works all the time. Facts and circumstances matter. And that, of course, is exactly what the theory tells us it should do. You need to price based on what arms length parties would have done in this particular same set of facts and circumstances. And where they're not available, 
all right? You look to uh, what I see is the spirit here rather than the letter. You go back to the law, which talks about we need a fair assessment of what the true taxable income of these parties would be in the absence of government interventions. So a focus on the spirit of the arm's length principle can be helpful in thinking about how to recognize that in terms of the methods. And I think the OECD 2017 guidelines go a long way to solving that. All right, Goliath number three. The arm's length, this is the new one, of course. The arm's length standard can't work in the digital economy. In a world of digital transactions, digital businesses, digital business models, for some reason, the arm's length principle can't handle this. Well, <laughs> um, we know that there are huge digital multinationals. The big five giants are have a market cap of, what, $5 trillion these days? They are golden geese, and there are lots of governments that would like to pluck that gold and, and capture some of it through taxes in a variety of, a variety of ways. Everything from that, that to sales taxes to what would have been tariffs, except we have a moratorium on electronic transactions. Uh, to new digital services taxes, taxes on technical services, taxes proposed 12B, taxes on digital, digital services, and now Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. I'm not going to review Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. I've done this extensively elsewhere, and I would refer you to the paper that Oliver Tridler and I have uh, written on this. And in particular, I'd like to, to refer you to Wolfgang Schoen's uh, at the um, uh, Max Planck Institute's two paper uh, here, one on the 10 questions about taxing the digital economy and his second paper on the one right answer. If there's anyone I agree with in terms of how we should tax the digital economy, it's Wolfgang Schoen and his 10 questions on how this should be done. So I'm not gonna go through Amount A or Amount B, Pillar 1 or Pillar 2, you've already heard uh, about those. Let me go just simply to a couple of the criticisms I've made earlier that I want to highlight, num number one. First, on Pillar A, I'm particularly concerned about Amount A, the new taxing right. Being new doesn't make it right, okay? Pillar 1 mixes two sets of rules, one set of rules for trade flows of goods and services, those rules are called the origin destination rules. And they do look at origin where stuff is made and destination, market jurisdiction, where stuff is sold. So that set of rules on looking at exports and imports and origin and destination, okay, typically handled by tariffs and also by handled by VAT rules, is a very different set of rules for when we're talking about foreign direct investment. When we're talking about FDI, we're looking at corporate income taxes and withholding taxes. And we're looking at, as I started out my talk today, residence and source. So my fundamental number one problem with pillar, uh, with uh, Mount A and pillar one is it's mixing apples with oranges. It's mixing origin and destination principles which belong in the goods sphere with exports and imports, with residence and, so and source rules that belong with business profits earned on entities engaged in foreign direct investment. That's my first criticism. Criticism number two is I think there's really very little theoretical, as I've tried to show, and em nor empirical foundation for pillar one, for something that is so fundamental, so new, and so risky the fact that we haven't got a lot of thinking and understanding about what the empirical effects of this are going to be is really problematic for me. I think we need a high level of caution for something that really is so fundamentally new. There are many dangers and it's not clear to me what the advantages are of following down the rabbit down into the hole of, of pillar one. And as I have just tried to tell you, the brand new progress report that has just been issued by the OECD is a wonderful good news story about BEPS-1 and how well it's working. 
And if it, if, if it can do that well under today's circumstances, the question is, do we really need this? Cannot we simply modify the existing OECD guidelines to take account of the digital economy? My third criticism of pillar one is I really think it's a Trojan horse for formulary apportionment. I don't care whether you call it formulary apportionment or fractional apportionment, it's the same thing. It's substituting, chopping up the multinational in percentages by some arbitrary number here and saying that that is getting at the true taxable income of the multinational. It is a very blunt cleaver replacing what was a fine grained tool developed over 90 years of thinking about how to implement the arm's length principle. So I think pillar one is, is a real problem because it's backdooring as a Trojan horse bringing in formulary apportionment and formulary apportionment, I think, is going to be much, much worse than what we've got now. My last criticism is I think the political disputes will go up, no, no, go up, not down. In other words, if the call is for certainty, for transparency here, and for reduction in disputes, I don't think pillar uh, one is going to get us there. Are there some alternatives? Yes. First of all, one that's already being talked about and happening is broadening the PE definition to create new sourcing op opportunities. And here I want to go back to Wolfgang Schoen again and his 10 questions and his one answer. I completely agree with what he's argued. It is fine to expand the PE to include digital PEs as long as what's going on is foreign direct investment which means a really clear understanding and definition of what FDI is. A firm engages in value adding activities in two countries. It's exploiting its ownership uh, advantages in a foreign country. It takes an equity take. It engages in conduct capacity and control, taking on risk in that foreign market. To the extent that digital transactions and digital flows meet those. I'm for expanding the PE definition to include new digital permanent establishments or virtual permanent establishments that have a very clear definition of foreign direct investment. I'm not for doing it for foreign portfolio investment, for doing it for exports, nor for doing it for cross-border business services, unless those services are, again, really closely tied to a commercial presence in the country of foreign direct investment. Alternative two, <clears throat> go ahead with pillar two. And I think there's much to like about pillar two, both the income inclusion rule, uh, the global min tax proposal, which I've written about too, and the tax on base eroding payments, which would either levy withholding tax or deny preferences if there's nothing going on on the other side of the table in the other jurisdiction. Again, whether they're needed depends upon whether the other action items in BEPS have taken care of the problem or not. The last one, and this is what well, the speakers coming after me may speak to, is the proposal to add 12B to the UN tax treaty to include digital services. I'm fine with expanding source countries having the right to tax cross-border business services that are foreign direct investment related. Even if they were primary, uh, the primary first crack is given to the residence country, the source country should have the right to tax. What I'm adamant about is it can't just be for exports and imports. It needs to be for foreign direct investment. You need conduct capacity control. You need some assumption of risk going on to raise these to the level of, um, of, of business profits then and then for business profits to be taxed. So my answer to Goliath number three, um, I think there's some fine tuning for the arms length standard that needs to be done for the digital economy. That fine tuning, in my view, doesn't involve pillar one. I think pillar one, despite all the time and effort that's been put on it, will be a minor short run, maybe, gain and trying to deter some digital taxes, although I think it won't. I think the digital taxes will be there anyway. 
for a potentially disastrous long run consequence, which is eroding the current system based on source and residence and the underpinning of that system by the arm's length principle. I'm for giving BEPS a chance. Let's, as we can see from the new report the OECD has issued, it can fix the loopholes in the system. It, to the extent those loopholes are reduced, the incentives for abusive transfer pricing go away. I'm for saying if we could start in 1968 with a chapter on transfer pricing of goods, and we could look at services, and then we could add intangibles, and now we have a new chapter in the OECD guidelines just added for financial transactions. Why can't we do one for digital transactions? Isn't that the natural next expansion? Stay with the arm's length principle and expand the transfer pricing guidelines to really build in a chapter that thinks, takes account of digital types of business transactions. Um, I think we need to also better understand these kinds of transactions. We need to differentiate them. If you're paying any attention to the WTO, you know there's been a moratorium on electronic transactions in place since 1998. There's a lot of talk about getting rid of that, including UMTED work that's been done showing how much developing countries have lost because they don't have the right to tax digital imports, digital goods, particularly cultural goods. Now, I will may say here, I'll be honest, I'm a Canadian by birth. I grew up in a country that was inundated with American TV, American radio, American media, and Canada for a long time has had cultural exceptions in place to protect its own cultural industries. The moratorium on digital transactions includes a lot of cultural industries. Maybe there's room there for developing countries to think about giving some protection to their own cultural industries. Now, those are good. Those are transactions in digital goods and goods that are virtually delivered through steaming, streaming processes. Business services are different again. Some of those are services that are delivered by streaming. You know, some of those are travel related. Some digital services are actually got physical entities in place on the ground that are delivering those commercial services. So there are various types of digital services and whether or not they can be taxed with a VAT or a services tax or should be taxed with a, some form of residence source under the corporate income tax depends upon the type and the mode of delivery of that service. And then lastly, of course, we have the true foreign direct investment, which is what we've been talking about today and where the transfer pricing rules are placed. So let me wrap up my talk here and say, I've tried to tell you today, as I said, as an academic standing back, looking at the big picture, I see the arm's length principle under attack. Um, by three Goliaths, or three major criticisms. The first, that transfer pricing is abusive. Number two, that we have an absence of comparables and a presence of synergies, so it can't work. And number three, we can't use it on the digital economy. And I've tried to play David here, going after each of those three Goliaths and saying, I think the arm's length principle is strong enough to handle all of them. And I'll end with one last point. We are living through COVID-19, a pandemic. Has anybody said, well, we can't apply transfer pricing in a pandemic? A once in 100 year event of a global pandemic and everybody's issuing rules on how we handle it using the existing transfer pricing rules. A pandemic was a crisis. It was high threat, high time, high surprise, came out of the blue, even if we maybe should have been predicting it. And the, the, like a little engine that could, the transfer pricing rules have risen to be able to do transfer pricing in COVID-19. And we're going to hear more about that this afternoon too. If the arm's length principle and the existing rules can be used for COVID-19, in the same way they were for the 2008-2009 financial crisis, 
Why can't they handle the digital economy? I think they can. I think they already much have. And I think a new chapter in the transfer pricing guidelines, both in the OECD, TP guidelines, and the UN draft manual. Matter of fact, I volunteer to help write it. I do. Um, could go a long way to solving these problems. And I want to thank you very much for offering me the opportunity to, I think, play a bit of devil's advocate and be a bit provocative today. And I look forward to your comments. Thanks. Thank you, Lorraine. Can you listen to me? Hi, can you listen to me, Lorraine? Creo que no me puede escuchar. Yes. Ah, ahora me puede escuchar. Debo ser por la, la traducción. Gracias. Estuviste espectacular, como siempre. Thank you. It was fun to do. Tenemos una pregunta. Es una pregunta de YouTube. La hace José Pat Leiva. Y es la siguiente. Dice el que, eh, ¿cómo piensas? A good morning, how should it be used to tax it? You want me to answer? Yes. How would the arms length principle should be then adapted? Okay. Let me say that I, I do think the uh, arms length principle can be used to tax the digital economy. Think about um, this, for example. Many of the digital transactions have much in common with intangibles. In other words, intangibles, the marginal cost of provision to an additional user is zero. Many digital ones have the same idea. The marginal cost of provision to an additional user is zero. While we may not have, we may or may not have good comparables for those, we certainly have been able to figure out how to tax intangibles. Think about the very simple. A non-sophisticated intangible can be done with a running royalty. We know how running royalties work. Could we devise a running royalty for digital transactions? Quite possibly. Part to value intangibles are a chapter that has been drafted for the OECD guidelines. And again, hard to value intangibles looks at what makes them hard to value and thinks about what I think of as the spirit of the arm's length principle. What would independent enterprises, if they've been in the same set of facts and circumstances, how would they have done this? If it's development or co-development, we know how to do that already from the cost sharing arrangements. So I think part of the digital economy, the key thing is to break the digital types down. You need to think which ones are digital goods, which ones are digital services, which ones are digital foreign direct investment and develop rules for those. Then the transfer pricing rules underpin these and I still think they can be applied here. Sí, lo que me preocupa un poco es que parece ser que la construcción del sistema tributario mundial se está, o la reconstrucción del sistema tributario mundial se está haciendo a partir de consideraciones políticas y no necesariamente técnicas. Entonces, eh, desde luego que soportamos totalmente las ideas que eh, propones y habrá que ver qué, qué es lo que pasa en el futuro. Pero sí, creo que hay que estar preocupados y esperar que la OCDE, en general la plataforma de colaboración conjunta, eh, pues si es posible, eh, se concentren en el futuro a muy largo plazo y no solamente en el, en el momento político. Well, I totally agree that I think what's driving this is politics and, and expediency. Um, the spread of digital sales taxes, digital service taxes uh, in, from country by country, and the U.S. Um, threatening to retaliate against them is, I think, why the OECD decided to move to Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. I don't think the flow of digital taxes is going away. And so I don't think Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 are going to result in getting rid of it. So I do think the politics is what's underlying this. And as I said, I'm, I'm an academic, I'm an economist. I like to take the long run view of things. And I think there are other ways to solve this problem. 
And there are other ways in a variety of ways. There are other ways. It doesn't have to be done through the corporate income tax. There are other ways to get at it here through the WTO, for example, in terms of, of uh, um, digital goods, through the GATS on digital services. It is. It can be done in a variety of formats. And all of those can be used to raise revenue for developing countries. The VAT in itself is an extraordinary revenue raiser and um, general sales taxes raise revenue. So I, I, my, I guess my bottom line view is in the effort to go after these digital giants, what's happened is the proposals that are backdoor bringing in formulary apportionment, which I think is a mistake, and also bringing in new ideas of, of origin and destination, which come from looking at exports, don't come from looking at FDI, don't belong in a world of corporate income taxes because then there's the corporate taxes focus on business profits. Exports and imports are the flows along with a whole variety of other things that generate profits, but they shouldn't be taxed in their own right. Yes, I, I, I think so. Eso pienso. Uh, tenemos una última pregunta por el tiempo, beneficio del tiempo. Es de Mahmouda Suhind que dice, Lorraine, are you suggesting that you are not, bueno, dice, perdóname, en inglés, español, dice, está sugiriendo que pues, tú no, no, te, no te pones a, a la jurisdicción de mercado como nexo, pero va eh, sugiriendo um, que la... I am opposed to market jurisdictions as nexus in the way as proposed under Pillar 1. Right, pillar two with the global min tax, I actually, where basically the source jurisdiction has the ability to levy a min tax, right? It would be administered by the residents, but in, in, if you read what I've written on it, there's every incentive for, this, uh, for the source countries, the developing countries to raise that min tax to the level. It would generate, as we know from the little data that's been released by the OECD on this, that all of the money is being generated by pillar two, not by pillar one. Of the four trillion dollars or whatever in tax, um, three quarters of that is coming from pillar two. Now, you, you are right. I, I am also thinking about some focus on nexus, but not nexus for markets. I'm focused on nexus at source for permanent establishments that are based on foreign direct investment. What I mean by that, is an entity that engages in another country that it does con con has conduct capacity control, takes on risk, is there to earn profits in that jurisdiction and therefore should be taxed in that jurisdiction. Whether it's a market or a non-market jurisdiction, to me is irrelevant. The question is, what's it doing on the ground in that country? And even if it's virtual, it may have enough level of activities there or be tied, sufficiently tied, to existing activities that it shan, can be counted. So for example, MAP activities. MAP activities in a jurisdiction, to the extent that they really are a source of core, competi core competitive advantage of the multinational. And their heavy attention is paid by the MNE to what's going on in that country. Yes, uh, they do. They could create nexus and create a permanent establishment. But I'm not for saying just because you have sales there, you know, just because a country imports, you have the right to put um, a pillar one on it. I, I think that's, um, that's apples and oranges. Okay. Rain, muchas gracias por tu presentación. Señores, la mejor economista del mundo en la materia. Estamos muy honrados de tenerte el día de hoy. Oh. Esperamos estar en contacto. You are too kind. Nos preparamos para el panel de las Naciones Unidas y damos un corte comercial mientras tanto. Gracias, Lorraine.